I am here today to talk about the power uh, of community um, in transforming our food systems, and particularly uh, the power of uh, unique communities, globally connected communities, uh, that I feel will, will really be the driver of food system change um, in the decades to come. And it's, it's not that uh, I think there's anything inherently bad or negative about uh, the local food movement, uh, but I do feel very strongly uh, that uh, when we begin to uh, look up uh, and see that there are a dozen, hundreds, if not thousands of local communities uh, struggling uh, to transform their own food systems, uh, we will be in a better place. Uh, I uh, say this in a very unique uh, perch. I am the Urban Sustainable Foods Fellow at Butler University, where I uh, get to work with stakeholders who are very interested in um, reforming their own local foods community. Um, and, but why I'm here and what I'm going to tell you about today is um, I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Sitka Salmon Shares, which is probably the country's most unique community-supported fishery. And if you've never heard of a community-supported fishery before, um, community-supported fisheries look to help uh, connect uh, consumers with the source of their food, with the source of their fish, in kind of unique uh, ways by helping to support local communities, working waterfronts, and helping consumers understand the challenges uh, that it takes to be a fisherman. The one big difference between our community supported fishery and the 125 uh, other community supported fisheries in the country is that our community supported fishery uh, does collapse about 3,000 miles of distance and takes fish, um, uh, salmon from Sitka, Alaska, and, and brings it into the Midwest, particularly into a community called Galesburg, Illinois, and then out across Midwestern markets. And um, in our community supported fishery, we have three chief objectives, um, two uh, that, that are, I think, unique in uh, what community supported fisheries do. Um, the first objective is to bring together producers and consumers in a unique, mutually uh, beneficial uh, relationship based on belonging and based on new types of belonging uh, in which uh, Sitka fishermen uh, and Juno fishermen, like the three families that fish on the FV Heather Ann, um, are brought into contact into new ways uh, with about 400 uh, to 450 Midwestern uh, consumers, letting them know about what it means to be a fisherman in Southeast Alaska, letting them know what it means um, to uh, fish with a gill net rather than with hook and line, rather than with a purse saner. And simultaneously, letting fishermen um, in a new and unique way, uh, know the challenges of being a, a, a fish consumer in the Midwest, where uh, we know that uh, there's rampant uh, fraud, that most of the fish that we get in the Midwest is uh, produced in very ecologically destructive manners. Uh, the second key component and the second uh, chief uh, goal that we have in our community supported fishery um, is to really operate uh, systemically and to think deliberately in new ways about the interconnectedness of food producers, food consumers, communities, um, and ecologies. Uh, we've set up unique ways in which um, our consumers can interact with the environments of Southeast Alaska by the fact that we, um, produce, that we uh, give 1% of all of our uh, revenue generated back to salmon habitat conservation and restoration. And we set up new and unique ways in which our fishermen can support local food communities in the Midwest uh, by a unique food, uh, community food granting programs. And the third thing that we are trying to do um, with Sitka Salmon Shares and with this unique community supported fishery that collapses distance um, over 3,000 miles is to do uh, what a food blogger um, and the Ecology Action Center of Nova Scotia uh, called breaking the commodity curse. Breaking the commodity curse in our fisheries. Uh, just because of the fact that we have 
Uh, most of our fish production and most of our fish communities uh, are uh, essentially commodity producers. Their fish goes into the system and it comes out the other side and its story, its community, the people that put in the labor to catch that fish uh, is lost. Uh, what we try to do at Sitka Salmon Shares and with our consumers and our producers um, and all the people that make this community supported fishery work is to get people, uh, whether they're the, our consumers in Madison, Wisconsin or Galesburg, Illinois or the Quad Cities to understand and to see the value of the communities that these fish come from. To be able to smell what it's like to walk down Catlian Street in Sitka. Um, and to be able to understand the work and the labor that goes in uh, to making uh, fish and to catching fish and the community connection that uh, is very much intertwined and that they make uh, actually take place uh, be, even though they're 3,000 uh, miles away from the source of this fish. And although this seems like a unique and, and perhaps different concept, uh, we are uh, and we always have been, uh, I believe, uh, a nation where on, on one level we see ourselves as, as independent farmers in our food system and independent fishermen in our food system, uh, but on another level there is a surprising and, and really long history of communities coming together to uh, work associationally to solve food problems and to provide uh, the needs of either food producers or food consumers or now increasingly uh, both producer and consumer. Uh, and we can provide a few examples of that here, uh, whether they, I kind of use this as the first great food uh, cooperative if you've never heard of the Grangers. Uh, they were a group of producers in the upper Midwest who worked together uh, to try to uh, minimize some of the challenges that came with working with increasingly monopolistic railroads, worked together to improve their community's food system uh, by, uh, among other things, um, pooling resources to buy infrastructure cooperatively, uh, really changed the political economy of the United States in the 1860s, 1870s, and increasingly in 1880s. We have, uh, of course, our great example from Alaska, which might have been the more interesting example nationally is the federal government bringing 900 Midwesterners uh, in the 1930s and placing them down uh, into the Matanuska Valley where they thought might be somewhat similar to uh, their Midwestern homes. Uh, them coming together and working cooperatively to address challenges in the food system uh, with the establishment of the Matanuska Valley uh, Farmers Cooperative Association. We have examples, uh, of course, from the 1960s and the 1970s of uh, people uh, and, and usually the younger generation, uh, some people you know, would call them hippies, coming together um, and moving back to the land and working cooperatively to achieve a healthier, uh, more sustainable food system. We have examples in the past of, of those uh, back to the landers coming back to uh, the urban environment, realizing that perhaps working the land wasn't what they wanted to do, but bringing that cooperative mentality with them um, and establishing uh, food cooperatives all over the country uh, in the 1970s. This one here, the, fam uh, the Famine Farms Cooperative uh, in Winona, Minnesota, uh, which gave birth um, in many ways to uh, some of the uh, natural grocery stores that we know of now uh, Whole Foods uh, among them. And finally, this great new movement uh, that began in the 1980s of community-supported agriculture and community-supported fisheries, uh, wherein uh, consumers and producers in an entirely new way began to associate together for the mutual benefit of them both. Uh, in 1986, there was two uh, community-supported agriculture programs in the country one of them being the Indian Line Farm in Massachusetts. Uh, today, depending on how you count them, uh, there's 2,000 of these cooperative uh, associations that are designed to make our food system a little bit better. And finally, our community-supported fisheries. Uh, from just 15 years ago, there being probably a couple 
uh, to today where we have 125 community supported fisheries that are looking to make uh, the seafood system a little bit better from the consumer's end, um, but also trying to fundamentally improve the lives of fish producers. And so we have this very long history, I would argue, of communal life and associations to um, get past some of the challenges of food production um, and food consumption and to address our food needs, not from an individual standpoint, not from an individual uh, perspective, not from self-interestedness, but from community and from cooperation. Um, and this really goes back, of course, to uh, American, like the, 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 the keystone of American democracy, right? Which is the fact um, that in a truly democratic society and in a truly democratic uh, culture, the best way to achieve both liberty and equality, right, going back to Alexis de Tocqueville, um, is to bond together in associational ways. And I'll read him here, which is Americans of all ages, all stations of life, and all types of dispositions are forever forming associations in democratic countries. Knowledge of how to combine in the, is the mother of all forms of knowledge. On um, its progress depends that of all others. We must work cooperatively to achieve real transformational change. We must work cooperatively to move and address our food system challenges. And so my call today um, is thinking about, uh, at least thinking more critically about the ways in which the local food movement has developed in the last 10 years and into the 15 years. And to ask our ourselves, can we think bigger and bolder about new globally interconnected communities that are gonna allow the local food movement um, to get past some of its earlier challenges um, that came right in the form of hunger and social justice where we all know that uh, probably the farm to fork metaphor, this great way that we conceptualize our food system doesn't really work all that well for people with poor food access, for people with poor food insecurity. And we also know um, that, that, that local foods and the local food movement has been rooted in the last, uh, since its inception in 10, 15 years ago, um, in an upper middle class whiteness that, and, that empowers a certain demographic in our country. We also, I think, should think bigger and bolder about globally interconnected community food systems uh, because I think uh, by doing so, we'll spend a little bit more time uh, looking up and looking out. By um, looking at our food communities, um, not from inwardly, but outwardly, and seeing our global interconnectedness and our global challenges, uh, I think we can do a little bit better in the future. I also wonder uh, in the local food movement uh, if we aren't doing something to create a mythic local past, especially when you look at the ways in which the fisheries economy developed in the North Pacific, the ways in which our fishery, fishery communities developed all over Alaska. They were from their very beginning in the white European settlement, connected and deeply interrooted with the global economy. Um, and if we try to return to something that wasn't actually there, uh, I don't know how honest we're being about where we can be in the future. And of course, the North Pacific's first commercial fishery um, took, uh, began uh, in the first decade of the 19th century just out of Sitka, Alaska. And finally, I think when we think globally about community connections and what can happen with in regards to transformational change, uh, we can see a little bit more clearly Sitka, Alaska, where our fish are caught and processed in Galesburg, Illinois, where our fish are brought into, um, distributed, and marketed. Their very unique common past, both communities moving past a manufacturing economy, whereas uh, Maytag just uh, uprooted itself from Galesburg in the last 10 years. The 
county's largest employer, and of course the pulp mill shutting down in Sitka 15 years ago. Seeing its globally interconnectedness with the commodity trade, whether it's corn and soy in, Sitka, in, in Galesburg, Illinois, and fish in Sitka, Alaska. And I think more importantly, when we see globally interconnected communities, uh, we can really see that here we have two rural communities struggling uh, to find uh, and to make sense of what it means to be a rural community, a diverse rural community, a thriving rural community in the 20th, 21st century, and how interconnected, in fact, they are through the development of uh, Sitka salmon shares and the community-supported fishery. I leave today with a paraphrase from John Muir that I rewrote, and I apologize for John Muir that I did that. Uh, but John Muir uh, wrote of nature 100 years ago uh, that everybody needs nature, that everyone needs uh, a place that is beauty as well as bread, uh, a place that to play in and a place to pray in, nature that may heal and give strength to the body and soul alike. And I think very much that that is a great expression of what kind of food systems that we can develop where everybody needs food, but they need food that is beauty as well as bread. We need food systems to play in and pray in, and we need food systems that may heal and give strength to the body and the soul alike. Thank you.